thank you everyone for coming along to my talk. Just about to hello, John. So, um, as we can see on the projector screen here, um, my name is Dean Lachana. Um, I work for a fantastic organisation called Tech Systems. I spent about uh, two and a half years with them. I've got a few kind of colleagues, familiar faces here, and a few familiar faces from you know, pre pandemic because it's the first time I've done a talk. Um, since uh, those, those dark days, so it's fantastic to be face to face, kind of, uh, you know, seeing all our kind of um, gestures and eye to eye contact and non-verbal communication, serendipity, those chance encounters, it's just fantastic, so I'm really, really to be pleased to be back in the room with all you great folks. Um, so yeah, so, so my talk's on um, how leaders, their important evolving role to enable organisational competitiveness and how they can set the conditions for everybody at any level within the organisation to enable uh, continuous transformation in a rapidly changing world. Um, I'm going to be bringing on board lots of stories from different organisations I've been fortunate to work at, and as I mentioned, the organisation that I'm very proud to be working with at the moment is uh, Tech Systems. Uh, Tech Systems is, if you haven't, ha haven't heard of, of them before, they're a global organisation um, who provide full stack um, uh, technology implementations, coaching, training, leadership support um, in lots of emerging fields and, and we have a great access to, to some fantastic talent and expertise and successes. So feel free to have a chat to me or a few of my colleagues in the room about them. Uh, something else that you may be seeing on the chairs in front of you as well is this a little underground publication that I'm involved with, involved with called The Agilist. I'm the editor of that publication. It's a non-profit publication for the Lean Agile community. Uh, it's a platform to allow thought leadership stories, experiences to be shared in a form of kind of slow journalism. Uh, so uh, feel free to pick up a copy and if you're interested just hit that URL there and you can find out how to get hold of it. Uh, so my talk is on uh, leaders' important role in enabling organisational competitiveness in a fast-changing world. And what I thought I'd do is bring in a quote from Jack Welsh, who um, uh, opinions are split on his leadership style. Uh, he um, was the CEO of General Electric about 20, 25 years ago, and he turned around the organisation to be, at the time, the most capitalised organisation in the world. And these words really resonate with me, and they may, re may resonate with, with, with you as well. It says, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So the rate of change in my book is definitely ever increasing. And um, to me, this speaks about how we as individuals need to go on a journey of personal change, how, how perhaps our teams need to go on a journey of personal change, our departments and wider organizations. And we could also extend that out to wider society as well. Something else which comes to my mind is um, a tool called uh, Pest and Analysis. It's a tool used to gain a macro picture of the industry that, that, um, that you're operating in, maybe your team's operating in, your organisation's operating in. I won't dwell on this too much because there's quite a lot here, but um, there's a great deal of political change. Um, there are uh, a great deal of economic change. We know uh, the impact of inflation, um, the pound, euro, yen, dollar in our pockets being stretched. There's a great deal of social change. We're hearing about democratic, uh, uh, demographic uh, shifts or collapses uh, in many parts of the, uh, of the world. Um, we are aware that um, as, our, uh, the, uh, as countries get older, uh, there's a high amount of tax burden. Uh, and that's no doubt going to impact our companies as well, our teams as well. Maybe not directly, but perhaps indirectly and certainly eventually. Technologically, there's a great deal of change. I shan't kind of labour the point, but we know about uh, generative AI and how that might be affecting um, the new services or values that we can offer, but also how that might have a detrimental impact upon our workforce. Also, uh, there's a great deal of legal change. There are global regulations which are changing. Certainly in the UK, you, people may be familiar with the repatriation of EU regulations within, with, uh, back into within the UK's jurisdiction. That's just one example. Uh, global trade wars um, is certainly things which are happening. Um, uh, trade wars between EU, America, and 
and some Asian countries. Um, and environmental as well is an ever-present and increasing concern for many uh, organisations and individuals and teams. So this is just a brief introduction to some of the macro changes which are going to be impacting us individually at a team level and organisational level. I've just received an email. <laughs> um, so um, something else which is uh, really impactful as well is um, how organisations need to be aware and actually step into how they might want to disrupt their own business model, cause um, a degree of um, internal disruption and change. One example I, I, I found really interesting is, um, is a partnership. This is about two or three year, years old now, but I think it's a really interesting story about a partnership between Deliveroo and Morrisons. So Deliveroo and Morrisons are forming a partnership where uh, Deliveroo becomes a retailer and Morrisons becomes the supplier for uh, Deliveroo. And Deliveroo allows kind of customers to have a, a subset of goods um, made available to their, uh, to their customers within a few minutes, which is a, a real business model disruption. So Morrison is acting as the wholesaler and deliverer is setting the prices themselves different to, different to Morrison's and being able to provide something to the customers in a few minutes. And if we think about the um, business model canvas that some of us may be aware of, it's touching every single area here. Every single area is changing. And it's not so much a process change, which I find really interesting, or a technological change. It's the change that many stakeholders need to go on for this. There are organisations such as Morrison's, which have been around for many, many decades, where many stakeholders become quite fearful and resistant. And some leaders need to foster the right gradual localised and contextual change for these experiments to occur. This may not have succeeded, but at least they're trying different things. Uh, Morrison's, who started off in the Victorian age, late Victorian age, partnering with, with, a, with a market disruptor in the form of Deliveroo. So what are the conditions for continuous transformation? And how can a leader play a role in enabling that emergence and continuous transformation? I'm going to be touching on four different areas here. One is leaders support individuals to test assumptions. Number two is leaders acting as grand conductors. Thirdly, leaders creating a safe to learn environment. And fourthly and finally, leaders forming and protecting what's called an, an adaptive space where innovators and operators can come together for this emergence to occur, this experimentation to occur. So the first one we're going to be touching on is uh, leaders supporting individuals to test assumptions. So to do this, um, we need to think about personal change and personal uh, opportunities and challenges that leaders may have. So a particular mindset that, that uh, we may foster is one where we see the world through order and we have an ordered response. This roughly maps onto an individual perhaps of a fixed mindset. And they met metabolize uh, um, uncertainty as risk and they may respond with, with false certainty. This individual may have a tendency to also rely on past experience. They were successful yesterday, fantastic, but the world's changing. We cannot always rely on past success. So how can this individual step into the unknown um, rather than having this kind of false misplaced comfort of repeating yesterday's success? Also, um, this individual, this leader, may want to shape the world, take control, micromanage, go through some set procedures which may have been successful yesterday. That creates a determinist outcome with predefined steps. So that's very much the mindset, a fixed mindset of an ordered response. What other response might a leader take? They could take one which is an adaptive response, a growth mindset, where they understand they do not know all the answers, they don't know what the next steps are, so they ask, they canvass people's opinions. And this could be people who are um, <clears throat> mavericks or troublemakers or dissenters. We need to be able to include those people in the right way into uh, allowing the, um, the leaders to ask the right kind of questions, scan the world for different opinions, have some diverse thinking to enable others to discover new approaches. 
also create the conditions for experimentation and emergence. So something that um, um, we've had success with at Tech Systems and no doubt individuals in this room have had some success with as well is taking a hypothesis driven response. This is from Barry O'Reilly, this image here. Uh, so we believe this capability will result in this outcome and we're confident to proceed when we see these things in the market or we see these things change within our organizations, maybe at a small scale. So I've got a fictitious example here from a fast food retailer. And this fast food retailer is very good at uh, running lots and lots of experiments globally, maybe locally first of all. And let's see how they might fictitiously um, run some experiments. So uh, they may have a quarterly business objective to trial um, payment using crypto in one part of the world, let's say North America, let's say US and Canada. So due to the substitution threat of customers choosing to pay with crypto more often than, than uh, Canadian dollar or US dollar, we believe offering payments by crypto in US and Canada will result in early adoption with young adults. We will be confident to proceed with this when uh, financial transactions can be completed within less than two seconds. That's a leading indicator. Uh, repeat usage with the top two most popular cryptocurrencies is um, greater than 85%. Again, that's the leading indicator. We can get this information very, very quickly once we've implemented some trials. Um, transactions for the, uh, the young adults under 35s is some small percentage. Again, that's the leading indicator. We can get that information fairly quickly. Um, and also, um, an increase in net promoter score for those customers. Again, that could be a leading indicator. And, and we want to uh, balance any kind of risk as well. We're going to design into the experiment um, something which could happen, which is untoward. So we want to make sure that price and fluctuation in crypto doesn't impact our revenue too greatly. And we, and we can, we, we're running this experiment for a couple of months as well, and only a few number of restaurants. So we, we're using limited liability to be able to design our experiments. I'm going to touch on this in a moment, but this is an important factor in... Um, those stakeholders, those leaders who may be somewhat sceptical, rather than running these experiments, despite them, we, we include them in the experiment design, we actually attract them, we pull them in to co-design this experiment with those caveats as well, such as uh, point number five. So that's a quick tour of um, um, leaders supporting individuals to test assumptions. Hopefully there's going to be some time at the end for some Q&A on these. The next one is on grand, on grand conductors. So here I want to pull in some thinking from David Marquet, who wrote the fantastic book, Turn the Ship Around. So he describes uh, organizations, if you think about them quite crudely, as uh, a pyramid structure where we have individuals and teams at the bottom of this pyramid. And at the top, at the apex of the organization, we have um, some leaders. What tends to happen is information, the context, what the customer needs are, are discovered with the individuals and teams at the bottom of the organization, and information is pushed up through the, through the ranks, through middle management, for a decision to happen at the apex. That decision comes back down again for the teams and individuals at the bottom to execute. Let's suppose that takes six weeks or eight weeks for that to occur. In a fast-moving market where the organization needs to outlearn and outcompete the competition, that's just not going to cut it. What we need to do is, rather than push information up to authority, David Marquet says we need to look for opportunities where authority can be pushed down to where information exists, those teams and individuals at the bottom of the organization. And a really simple way of looking at this is uh, the dynamic between the amount of control an individual has and their competency and clarity. If the individual has great technical competency, and clarity of what their mission is, perhaps within their team or their department or business unit, they should be afforded a great amount of control. But this cannot happen overnight to be able to operate in the top right corner of this illustration. What David Marquez says is that we've got to incrementally, as leaders, be able to coach our, 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 our team members to be able to move up to the top right corner. And there's quite an interesting dialogue which can occur to allow this to happen. Actually, I had a conversation with a team member based on this today. We, we're setting up, we're in the change team, and one of the things that we're doing is setting up dashboards to um, allow technical project managers to um, get flow metrics to make decisions. And this is something that we're beginning to talk to a few TPMs about. 
and I was speaking to this more junior colleague, a, a recent graduate. Um, so rather than me telling him what to do, I was asking him, what does he think? What does he recommend? What can he suggest? So rather than operating at the bottom of this kind of dialogue exchange, I was trying to operate at, at level three, because that's his level of maturity. He's got some fantastic ideas, but may not have the confidence. So this is allowing that individual, because I know he has the competency, technical competency. I know he has the clarity. I want to give him more control through this leadership dialogue. So, so gradually, over, over iterations, over a few months, over a few quarters, maybe after a year or two, hopefully this individual and other team members will be operating more towards number two on the left-hand side here. Okay. Thirdly, uh, another aspect which allows uh, leaders to set this condition for continuous transformation in a fast-changing world is enabling safe to learn experiments to occur in, 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 in the right environments. Here I'd like to put in some thinking from the organisational psychologist, uh, Ron Westrom. Again, some of us may be familiar with this work here, but Ron Westrom um, has studied many different um, business units and organisations and came up with this categorisation or this topology of uh, organisations. And some organisations are highly path uh, pathological some are bureaucratic, some are generative. And to bring this to life, I want to bring in um, a story of NASA. So NASA um, was formed in response to Russian Sputnik in the late 50s, early 60s. And they were hugely generative. Engineers and scientists will speak together on a daily basis. They actually, during the Apollo mission, um, they spent some time setting up um, intercom systems across uh, uh, all the different sites in America. So an engineer and a scientist, a leader, was able to listen in on other calls. So this allows a great deal of uh, information to be shared, maybe risks to be shared, messengers to be trained, high collaboration. The, the, the silos or the value streams are very much allowing this generative uh, culture to emerge. A great deal of bridging between different um, departments. And as we know, our, our history of spaceflight, um, fantastic successes with the Gemini and Apollo program. But unfortunately, um, NASA began to solidify, calcify around certain silos, which led to a great deal of um, efficiency, but maybe not effectiveness. And this led to uh, situations, because of those efficiency drives of leaders, of engineers, of scientists not really speaking to each other. And... Um, what happened in 1986, there was great political pressure for uh, the Challenger shuttle to launch. Uh, but they chose to launch under great pressure on a very, very uh, bitterly cold morning. And um, the booster rockets which helped uh, put this, um, the uh, space shuttle Challenger into flight weren't designed to operate at such a, a cold temperature. There's an O-ring, which is a sealant, which seals these booster rockets. And the engineers, the manufacturers, were desperately trying to tell the leadership team, do not launch on this, uh, on this cold morning. We haven't tested it to these kind of thresholds. So the information was there. Was try it was, they were trying to share the information, what the risks were. But because the leaders are under great amount of political pressure, that, that shuttle launched. And that actually resulted in the loss of seven astronauts astronauts on that morning. But the information was there. The organisation knew about it. They'd become bureaucratic, perhaps pathological, from a generative um, a number of successes from previous programmes. So I just wanted to quote something from uh, Barry O'Reilly in his book, uh, Unlearn. He says that NASA was having tremendous success with its manned space programme. The organisation, while it's doing so, the organisation has sown the seeds of failure generating false intellectual superiority in, uh, and towers of information. In time, these towers turned into silos and they stopped the information from flowing across the organisation. This became a real problem for NASA and led directly to catastrophic failure with a loss of life. I think he's talking about um, a 1986 day of the shuttle programme. So um, our organisations may map to one of these and then move, may move between these different states. So there's something to be aware of. So how can we respond to this? How can we allow experimentation to happen in a, a, in a generative culture? One thing that uh, I was involved with for uh, a large UK retailer was setting up 
governance which enabled learning, governance which didn't constrain learning, actually enabled uh, learning. And what we did, and I'm going to run through this because I've got a 10 minute warning, uh, is um, so if individuals and teams in a particular innovation space understand uh, the mission and they have the competency, allow them to backlog ideas as long as it has tr strategic uh, alignment, it feel, fulfills the strategic ambition of that particular business unit, there should be no governance constraints on that. Um, of a few that want to go into progress, then we need to uh, build it. We want to run some, uh, um, some rapid experiments which are fast, inexpensive, simple and tiny. And we may want to inform the CFO here, particularly if it's a small constraint, maybe a small part of the market. Of the few which kind of graduate, they, they fulfill their success criteria, of the few we want to nail it, we want to run experiments with tighter hypotheses, maybe a bit wider. The governance structure is a little bit tighter for these. We want to get the CFO's um, blessing and the CEO's blessing. This is a real example of, of a customer that we work for. And we might want to limit the capital expenditure. Of the few which graduate beyond that, it may only be one in 10. We want to scale it. This becomes a going concern. This becomes part of what the organization sustains. And this is where we need to be even more tighter with our governance. So we want to have CFO and CEO approval. And then finally, we want to operate it. So there's even tighter constraints here. We need to, we, we need to review it quarterly. It's not fire and forget. We want to come back to the table. Is it still fulfilling our uh, viability, desirability, and feasibility of the organization and its customers? We may start off with low confidence with many of these. We want to see which ones stick to the wall, put crudely. And in a few of these, we have high confidence, and they become viable for the market. And we may retire those which become less viable. I'm going to move on real quick to the fourth one, because I've probably only got about five minutes left. So finally, leaders form it and protect it and adapt a space for innovators and operators. So I want to pull in some work from another academic, Mary Albing, fantastic complexity thinker. And what she talks about is how those entrepreneurs, those innovators, they, they um, have different needs to be able to test and learn, probably through failure. Whereas the operators tend to have different incentives have a different culture. Those who are on the operational side of the business um, want to be able to um, um, repeat existing ways of working, existing uh, repeat and scale different um, products and services. But what happens is the operational system stifles the emergence of the entrepreneurial system. But what we really need to do, because in a fast moving market, is actually take benefit of what the entrepreneurs and innovators are doing, is actually find new opp opportunities for the operators. They need to coexist. So, what Mary Albin talks about is creating an, an adaptive space where frank debate and experimentation can, can occur. So, some of the techniques here, large room facilitation techniques such as liberating structures, really works here. You can have co labs, summit labs, bringing in design thinking. But this needs to be under the auspices and protection of the leadership team. We need to be able to find opportunities where leaders, transformation directors, can actually protect uh, those innovators from the status quo who may actually try to close down his experiments. Just a quick example on this. Uh, the grocery retailer I worked for, we run into, this is about five or six years ago, allow customers to purchase products in local stores by scanning the barcode with their, um, with their iPhones. We had stakeholders who were very against this, are very resistant, but we want to include them in the experiment design, not work despite them. So what we did, we only had it available for meal deals in three local stores for two weeks and actually um, limited the amount of money that people could spend. And we trained and supported colleagues within the store, security, uh, cashiers and so forth. We run this experiment using this this notion of limited liabilities, and it was successful. We actually rolled it out. There would have been nine other experiments which failed. But what the leaders are doing, they're setting an environment for those innovators and operators to work together to run this experiment, see which ones work. So I'm going to skip over this, because I know we want to save some time for questions. And just wrap up, just on the quote from Jack Welsh. So if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of the in, 
rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So how might this resonate with us individually or our teams or our organisations? This is affecting all of us right now, so this is very, very pertinent. So what I've done, I've, I've looked at four different areas where leaders can help create these environment, uh, this environment for continu continuous transformation. One is leaders support individuals to test assumptions. Number two, leaders acting as grand conductors. Number three, leaders create that safe to learn environment. Fourthly, leaders protecting and adapt a space for innovators and operators. And just throw up a few images here, just to remind ourselves. And I want to pause for questions if I have time, Martin. Two or three questions. Good. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, are there any questions, thoughts, experiences, stories?